Okay, so now we will study dispute resolution or we'll go through this chapter, chapter eight of your syllabus. This is quite an interesting chapter. This chapter talks about how disputes are resolved among the state parties when it comes to the matters related to the sea. It is a high seas basically and also to the sea. So conflicts and disputes under the law of the sea may be primarily addressed by way of settlement in a peaceful manner in compliance with Article three of the United Nations Charter. So primarily speaking, the first approach of the state parties should always be that they approach the matter um, in a peaceful way and they should endeavor to settle the, uh, settle the dispute between the state parties or between each other and they have to come up with a settlement plan. So the first, uh, you know, the, the primary uh, way of addressing any conflict or a dispute under the United Nations Charter Article 3 is to settle the matter in a peaceful manner. However, if the matter remains unsettled, that is not capable of being negotiated and the matter did not finally cul culminate and or after negotiation, if it does not culminate or end in the drawing of a settlement agreement, then the dispute may be referred to the appropriate adjudicatory body established under the relevant law. So before seeking adjudication under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, it is mandatory that all local remedies or settlement and adjudication are exhausted. And only after that, international recourse of remediation must be sought under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea 3, that is of 1982, as specified under Article 295 of the said convention. Now, what does this mean? It says that, First, whenever there is a dispute, the state parties must exhaust all existing remedies before them. That is, local remedies that are available before them. And only when it, the matter is not resolved at a local level, then they should go for international remediation of their dispute. Now, this is specified under Article 295 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Three or the 1982 Convention of the Law of the Sea. Article 279 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, 3 of 1982, it obligates the disputing parties to settle their disputes by peaceful means. Okay, that means the first thing that one has to do is to settle it, uh, you know, amicably. So first thing they have to do is try to settle the dispute on an amicable basis or amicably, that is by peaceful means. Part 15 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, 1982, it deals with the settlement of disputes. So the other adjudicatory mechanism or resolution of disputes mechanism is first is, of course, by conciliation or forming of a conciliatory body. Now, conciliation is also one of the modes of a peaceful settlement. One of the parties agree to settle the dispute by conciliation in compliance with Article 284 of the United Nations Convention of the Sea. 3 of 1982 suppose once they you know once the parties agree then again they move further towards forming a conciliatory body which must compose of five members and then they establish this you know this kind of a panel for the purpose of resolving the dispute i'm reiterating for you again so that you understand this concept what is conciliation conciliation is also a mode of peaceful settlement now, the parties need to understand and agree together, yes, we need to go for conciliation. Now, th now, this mode is explained in Article 284 of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea 3 of 1982. Conci conciliation basically means where settlement is brought about by a particular panel who are called conciliators so they it's a particular panel where say now and according to this uh, united nation convention of the law of the sea there must be at least five members the a conciliatory body should compose a comprise of five members but two of them are appointed by one state party one conflict in state party and two the other two is again by the other state party right so it becomes two plus two four and then 
one person will be of course an impartial member that they are not is not connected to either of the state parties so that makes total of five members so every conciliatory body should have a minimum of five members and that is established for the purpose of resolving the dispute once the parties agree to settle the dispute by conciliation which is in compliance with article 284 of two united nation convention of the law of the sea 3 of 1982 now here, the parties are bound to the rules established in the conciliatory process. That means both the state parties, the disputing parties, they are bound to follow the rules that are established in the conciliatory process. However, if one of the parties has not consented to resolve the matter by conciliation, at its inception, that is in the very beginning, then the parties are not bound by it and may opt for the other existing modes of adjudicating their dispute. Sometimes it happens that probably one of the parties says that no, I'm not interested to go in for conciliation. One of the state parties representative may say on behalf of the state, of course, the disputing state might say that no, we are not interested to go for conciliation. I prefer some other mode of resolving my dispute. That other modes, of course, we will be discussing in the further slides, like arbitrary tribunal, arbitration tribunal, or special arbitration tribunal or even the ICJ, that is the International Court of Justice, and so on. So they might say, no, We, depending upon the facts and circumstances of each case, they might say, no, no, we're not interested in this. Suppose say there is a boundary dispute, for example, they might say, no, we're not interested in this. I, I think we'd rather go for an arbitration tribunal, probably, or maybe, no, it's not going to resolve, let us go to the ICJ. I don't have reposed confidence even in the arbitral tribunal as well, so let me just go and approach uh, you know, the International Court of Justice, probably. So it depends on the parties. However, as per the law, as per the International Law of the Sea, the first option is always to settle the matter by, to settle the matter, that is, by amicable means. And in case they want a third party intervention, then they can form a, a you know, a conciliatory body. And by way of conciliation, they can resolve the uh, you know, their dispute. And for the purpose of conciliation, they need to have at least five members, two members appointed by one of two, one of the state uh, disputing parties. And again, the other party also is entitled to have, uh, you know, or to appoint their members on the team. And one should be an impartial member so as to arrive at a proper decision. However, if the parties agree to resolve the dispute by conciliation, the conciliation committee, that is a commission that is formed of at least five members, the matter is, of course, taken up by them. And each party may propose two members to form, that's what I was saying earlier, to form the panel, and one may be an independent member. The conciliation commission shall hear the parties and elicit evidence. That means it may extract evidence or ask the parties to, you know, come on, submit your uh, certain relevant documents, whatever documents that you have, and just put forth your arguments and your evidence in the process so as to help the conciliators to uh, you know, arrive at a particular decision or a conclusion. So the commission, therefore, as per the law, as per the international uh, you know, law of the sea, should resolve the dispute within 12 months and prepare a report of conciliation after they arrive at a particular conclusion or a decision in whoever, I mean, in, I mean, in favor of whoever it is either, for example, state party A or state party B. Now, the example, the classic example of this is a dispute that took place between uh, 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 Australia and Timor Leste in 2016, that was a maritime bond boundary dispute. And, um, uh, you know, by way of this procedure conciliation, you know, in 2016, Timor Leste and Australia, they negotiated their maritime boundary dispute. And this is regarded as actually the first case of conciliation under the new law of 1982, that is United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Article 284 of United Nations Convention of the C3 refers to the provision relating to conciliation and it states that a state party which is a party to a dispute concerning the interpretation or application of this convention may invite the other party or parties to submit the dispute to conciliation in accordance with the procedure under Annex 5, Section 1 or another conciliation procedure. And if the invitation is accepted, 
by the opposite party or by the other state party. And if the parties agree under the conciliation procedure to be applied, then any party may submit the dispute to that procedure, that which procedure, the conciliation procedure. Now, if the invitation is not accepted, say one of the parties disagree to go ahead with the conciliation, then what happens? Conciliation is deemed to be terminated or in case they've already formed the council or they've formed the committee or the commission that is deemed to be, you know, uh, what they say, dissolved. So the next thing is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, ITLOS. The International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea is an international body of adjudication to adjudicate disputes pertaining to the contravention of United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea. That is, if there is, if any state party contravenes the provisions of this law, that is a law of the sea, it contravenes or go against or trespasses any of the provisions to the extent that it does not comply with any of the provisions, it contravenes, it goes against the provisions. And there are some other allied disputes that specializes to the extent or that can be brought within the ambit of interpretation or there's interpretation of the clauses problem uh, or you know they have a problem in interpreting the law itself and say there is a mistaken belief and there is a mistaken interpretation of the law and a party is acting on the mistaken interpretation then such matters can come to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Now, this tribunal is set up, of course, under the, the new law of 1982, that is the Convention of 1982 in Hamburg, Germany, which consists of 21 members, or that means it should compose of 21 members. And these members are people who are distinguished experts in the, in the field of the law of the sea. Next, we have the International Court of Justice or ICJ. The ICJ is a general international court that we all know and that handles matters, even disputes under the law of the sea. So even matters relating to the law of the sea or uh, any, say for example, high sea dispute can also, or boundary dispute between, uh, you know, can also be maritime boundary dispute can also be referred to the, um, International Court of Justice. So the ICJ is composed of 15 members and they are appointed by the Security Council of the United Nations. Next is the General Arbitral Tribunal or GATT. General Arbitral Tribunal or GATT. So Arbitral Tribunal or the General Arbitral Tribunal is established to resolve disputes under the law of the sea. It is established under next year seven of the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, this arbitral tribunal or GAT, G-A-T, abbreviated GAT, is composed of five members. And, you know, just as we discussed uh, in the conciliation proceeding, similar to that, these five members are, you know, are, uh, you know, are members, uh, you know, who are appointed as arbitrators by each state party when they are entitled to appoint one member and the, and the first two members, you know, if they agree on appointing the, the, the first two members, see, like for example, state party A, state party B, they are two conflicting or disputing parties. So like the conciliation procedure, they are also entitled to appoint one member of their choice. However, in conciliation proceeding, the difference is there you are entitled to appoint two members. Here you're entitled to appoint one member. So you have two state parties fighting against each other or over a particular dispute, they're having a brawl over a particular dispute or a, a problem, they have some problem, they're having a brawl. So one party can appoint one member, the other party can appoint another member. So then what happens? You have two members. Now these two members who are appointed, they further agree on appointing three additional members. So how much it becomes? Five members. So the arbitral tribunal should minimum contain or compose of at least five members to decide on a dispute. So they are appointed as arbitrators for the tribunal of, and now of the member again, of the five members again appointed, one of them shall be appointed as a president of the tribunal. Now every dispute will be addressed by a new tribunal fund for that particular dispute and new members will be appointed for that purpose. So that obviously, because now if 
each state party is entitled to appoint one member each. That means, of course, there are different state parties and different state parties may choose to have their own members. It's not the same members, obviously. When you understand the principle, when, you, when we understand that, of course, when each party appoints, it's obvious that uh, you know, it's, they are not uh, the same members for all disputes. So each uh, disputing nation has got the right to appoint their own members, at least one, one. And then the two who, uh, you know, who uh, they are representing the state. So the two of them are entitled to appoint three additional. So at least they should have five members. Now, here what happens, the decisions that are made by, are normally taken by majority vote with a quorum of at least 50% of the members present. And in case of a tie, the president shall have a veto vote. Now this president is appointed from among the five members and his additional vote shall settle the case and provide a binding decision. So arbitral awards are binding. They are called as arbitral award, A-W-A-R-D, award. Arbitral awards are binding on the state parties because they're the ones who decided to approach the general arbitral tribunal, which can be established under Article 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention. It's binding. That means the parties must comply with the award. That is, the decision is final. Next is a special arbitral tribunal or SAT. The SAT is established to resolve special matters related to fisheries, that is, special tribunal when matters, uh, you know, in special instances like fisheries or matters relating to marine environment or conservation or protection, pollution, etc. So for the purpose of resolving the disputes again here, five members need to be appointed out of the 21 member specialized expert list maintained by the relevant agencies of UN in that area. So each disputing state party may choose two members of the list. So as a conclusion, the decision of the tribunal established under the law of the sea, they operate as a persuasive precedent and not binding precedents. So what do we mean by that? That means, uh, what is a persuasion? Now, this is, um, you know, another aspect of law. So normally when decisions are taken by the courts, they are like, there are those precedents, that those decisions or judgments become precedents, judicial precedents. So uh, then there are judicial proceedings. For example, the, the decision or the judgment of the higher court is binding on the lower court. That means the lower court is bound to follow that particular proceeding. However, if a case is decided by a court of equal jurisdiction, say if there are say, for example, high court of one state and high court of another state, so both are high courts, and then they, um, you know, uh, decide on a case and judgment is passed. So they become of equal jurisdiction. So when there is the question of equal jurisdiction, so the precedents may not be binding, but they are persuasive. So likewise, under this particular law, the decision of tribunal established under the law of the seat operates as a persuasive precedent. That means they may or may not take the example of other cases, right? And they are not binding precedents. Now, here we are talking about using the principle that has been used in other cases, right? If a particular principle is used in another case, so a person uh, will not be really able to argue and say that, no, in that particular case, it was decided like this. So please you decide it even in this case, right? So, they would, so, the, so the answer to that is under this law, it is not binding. The decisions that are taken in other cases are not binding, but they may be persuasive to the extent that, okay, we might think about that. If somebody has decided on those lines, so let us also think on those lines and see in the best interest of justice to draw a conclusion in one particular case. So when we're talking about precedents, we're talking about the decisions that are made. On the other hand, when I was talking about binding on the parties, when I said an arbitral award is binding, or the arbitral tribunal decision is binding on the parties, when it's binding on the parties, that means the parties to the dispute, they have to follow what the arbitral award says. 
and in whose favor the decision has given that is final and binding, right? And when I'm talking about precedence, is it is like uh, the decision of the court, whether at all someone else can draw some principles from the decision or can draw some ideas in resolving the case, right? So that is precedent. It has set a precedent. So the question of pass away as a precedent or binding precedent does not really, you know, work in the, in the aspects of the law of the sea. However, you can say that, yeah, they might use a principle that is used in some other case, and therefore it is persuasive in nature, and it is not really binding. That means they are not obligated to follow the decisions of, of uh, you know, the, of any case uh, or decisions of some other case where some other court has decided on a particular case. So it's not binding, but it might be persuasive. Article 287 of UNCLOS 3, that is 1982 convention, provides for the modes of resolving disputes. So what are the different modes? Some of the modes that we have already discussed earlier. So this is uh, the reference to the law here. Article 287 of the convention, it reads, when signing, ratifying, or acceding to this convention or at any time thereafter, a state shall be free to choose by means of written declaration one or more of the following means for settlement of disputes concerning the interpretation or application of this convention. So they can settle it either by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea established in accordance with Annex 6 or the International Court of Justice, or uh, they might approach the International Court of Justice or an arbitral tribunal constituted in accordance to Annex 7 or a form a special arbitral tribunal which is constituted in accordance with Annex 7 again for one or more of the categories of disputes specified therein. A declaration made under paragraph 1 shall not affect or be affected by the obligations of a state party to accept the jurisdiction of the seabed disputes chamber, so uh, of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to the extent and in the manner provided under part 11 section 5 of the particular convention that is the 1982 convention now what does part 11 talks talk about part 11 section 5 that we referred to earlier here in the previous slide it deals with the settlement of disputes and advisory opinions and provides for the establishment of the seabed chamber disputes tribunal that is when there are matters relating to seabed chamber disputes so there is a special tribunal that is established for that purpose for adjudicating those disputes at the seabed chamber disputes tribunal now, Article 287 further reads that a state party, which is a party to a dispute, which is not covered by declaration in force, shall be deemed to have accepted arbitration in accordance with Annex 7. Now, the parties to a dispute have accepted the same procedure for settlement of dispute. It may be submitted only to that procedure unless the parties otherwise agree. If the parties to a dispute have not accepted the same procedure for the settlement of the dispute, it may be submitted only to arbitration in accordance to Annex Seven. Now further, let's move on to Article 288. Now, 288 talks about the jurisdiction. A court or a tribunal that is referred to in Article 287 shall have jurisdiction over any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. Which convention? The United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, the particular convention in which this article is adumbrated. So a court or a tribunal referred to in Article 287 shall also have jurisdiction over any dispute concerning the interpretation of any international agreement or the convention itself. And the seabed disputes chamber of an international tribunal for the law of the seas established in accordance with Article 6 and any other chamber or, or arbitral tribunal referred to part 11, section 5, shall have jurisdiction in any matter which is submitted to it in accordance therewith. Now, Article 289 deals with experts appointed to the tribunal. Now, in any dispute involving, say, scientific or technical matters, a court or tribunal exercising jurisdiction under this section may, at the request of a party or proprio motto, select in consultation with the parties no fewer than two scientific or technical experts, chosen preferably 
from the relevant list prepared in accordance with Annex 8, Article 2, to sit with the court or tribunal, but without the right to vote. So just to adjudicate matters to, for the ease of adjudication, two experts are appointed to the tribunals in accordance with Article 2 of Annex 8 to this convention. Article 292 talks about prompt release of vessels and crews. That is what happens if any vessel or a ship is detained and probably the detention is unjustified. Where the authorities of a state party have detained a vessel flying the, the nag of another state, that is over another state, and it is alleged that the detaining state has not complied with the provisions of this convention, then it may ask for a prompt release of its vessel and its crew upon the posting of a reasonable bond, a security bond, or other financial security. And the question of release from detention may be submitted to any court or tribunal agreed upon by the parties. Of failing such an agreement within 10 days time from the time of detention, to, they might submit their application to a court or tribunal that is accepted by a detaining state under Article 287 or to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, unless the party is otherwise agreed. Now, the application for release may be made only and or on behalf of the flag state of the vessel. The court or tribunal shall deal without delay with the application for release and shall deal with only uh, the question of release without prejudice to the merits of any case. That means they do not want to go into the merits of the case about who is right and who is wrong, but the question of release in case there is misinterpretation of any, con of any convention terms. And upon the posting of the bond, the security bond, or other financial security determined by the court or tribunal, the authorities of the detaining state shall comply promptly with the decision concerning the release of the vessel or its crew. Now, the applicable law is laid down in Article 293, which reads that a court or a tribunal having jurisdiction under this section shall apply this convention, the rules of international law, and other rules of international law, which is not incompatible, that is compatible with this convention. Um, paragraph one does not prejudice the power of the court or tribunal having jurisdiction under section to decide a case ex equa et bono if the party so agrees. So what is ex equa et bono? That means it's a Latin term basically. That means the case shall be decided on principles of justice, equity, fairness, and good conscience. Now, Article 296 talks about finality and binding force of decisions upon the parties to the dispute. Any decision rendered by a court or tribunal having jurisdiction under this section shall be final and shall be complied with by all the parties to the dispute. That means, as we discussed earlier, remember we said it's binding. It's binding over, you know, upon all the parties to the dispute between the state parties. They've decided to refer the case to a particular tribunal. So they are bound by the decision or the award of a particular tribunal. In case it's arbitration, you call it as an arbitral. In case a matter is you know, referred to arbitration or an arbitral tribunal, so the judgment of an arbitration tribunal is called as an award, not a judgment. You might call a judgment, but however, the right word is award. So this is all with this. We complete our syllabus. You have eight chapters. Chapter one, we discussed about the law of the sea introduction and brief history. In chapter two, we studied maritime areas and innocent passage. In chapter three, we studied freedom of navigation. In chapter four, we studied high seas and United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. In chapter five, we spoke about piracy as an international crime. In chapter six, that is we studied during the last class, we spoke about the EEZ, that is the Exclusive Economic Zone. In chapter seven, that is today, we spoke about Allied Convention. And now we discussed the dispute resolution mechanism under the law of the sea. So with this, we complete your syllabus. If you have any questions, you can ask me.